Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming here tonight. Uh, we have a very special guest, uh, Professor Thomas Pogge from Yale. Um, this event was organized in part by the Rutgers Philosophy Club and uh, the Rutgers chapter of Giving What We Can. Um, thank you very much for coming. Thomas Pogge. Thanks, Boris, and I think you mentioned, I mean, you forgot to mention the most important thing. This is the one year, isn't it, anniversary oh, third of? Year, third year anniversary. Third year anniversary of giving what we can. And Rutgers. And Rutgers. Yes, the Rutgers job. All right. Good. So onwards, so what I will do is talk a little bit about what makes the work that giving what we can does so important, and leave as much as I can time for discussion afterwards that you can highlight some of the things, discuss some of the things that I will be talking about. So let's start from the fact that uh, maybe the most uh, under-realized human right of all the human rights that are recognized by the United Nations in all their various documents is this one here, which says that everyone has the right to a standard of living that's adequate for the health and well-being of oneself and one's family, including food, clothing, housing, medical care, and necessary social services. Uh, very large numbers of people still suffer from various kinds of deprivations. And you can see here what these deprivations are that are clearly poverty relevant and that would seem to clearly indicate that if you have one of these deprivations, you are not uh, secure in your right of Article 25 of the Universal Declaration. We have about 7.2 billion people these days in the world, and among them the latest official figures, and I'll have more to say about that later, uh, say that 842 million are chronically undernourished, and then again, very large numbers of people lack access to essential medicines, safe drinking water, shelter, electricity, sanitation, literacy, and a lot of children are still doing wage labor out of, outside of their own households often under very, very bad conditions, slavery-like conditions, hazardous conditions, working as soldiers, prostitutes, domestic servants, and so forth. So these statistics are bad enough. Even worse are the statistics about how many people die early from poverty-related causes. Conservatively estimated, that's about a third of all human deaths, about 18 million every year. And I estimated that conservatively by simply sorting people by cause of death and singling out those causes of death that are quite common in the poor countries and almost unheard of in the rich countries. And so if you just look at them, you can see what they are. Obviously, poor people die very often from causes that we know very well, like diabetes, heart disease, and so forth. And they die much sooner than we do because of higher environmental burdens and also lousy medical care where they live. And so it's quite likely that there are many, many premature deaths from causes other than the ones listed. But I haven't uh, added any of those into the calculation. So even just on this conservative estimate, you come to about 18 million a year, or one third of all uh, of the flow of deaths. Now, if you put that in perspective, that's a pretty large number, 18 million a year. That's 416 million over the period since the end of the Cold War, 23 years. And it dwarfs the number of people who died from government-sponsored violence of one sort or the other in the entire 20th century, which I've given you there as comparison. So that's about 200 million in total, of which by far the biggest is the 60 million who died in the Second World War. But it also includes the concentration camps, the gulags, the uh, repression without war, the civil wars, and so on. All of that over an entire century killed about 200 million versus 400 million over the 23 years since the end of the Cold War. Now, if you ask why does poverty persist to such an astonishing degree, why is there still so much poverty around, so much suffering, uh, the first level sort of superficial answer has got to be it's the distribution of income in the world, income and wealth. And you can see here the latest figures for 2008 as collected by Branko Milanovic, who is the World Bank's leading inequality researcher. And you can see here how that income in the world is distributed. 
basically the blue area, dark blue and baby blue, is the top quintile. A quintile is one fifth of the human population. And that takes already 85% of the cake. 85% of all income in the world goes to those 20% of the world's population. And you can see how much uh, the other quintiles get, much, much less certainly. And the bottom quintile has not even 1% of global household income, not even a single percent. The distribution of wealth is much more unequal, and that's intuitive if you think about it, because most people who are wealthy have more than an annual income in wealth. Their wealth exceeds an annual income, whereas most people who are poor have well under one annual income in wealth or savings. And so you have even greater inequality here the, just the top 8.4% of the human population takes well over 80% of global wealth, and only 3% goes to the bottom two-thirds, to the 68.73% who have less than $10,000 to their net. So enormous inequalities are what continue, makes poverty continue in existence. Now, what people will say when you say that it's lamentable that there's still so much poverty in the world, often people say, well, look, there's so much progress. We've made so much progress. Don't you know about the MDGs, for example, the Millennium Development Goals, and how we've all pulled together and made this very heroic effort to reduce poverty? And don't you know that poverty has shrunk and has gotten better and better and better in the last 20, 30 years? And so people say deprivations have become less frequent, at the very least in percentage terms, which are the terms in which the MDGs are formulated. Now, I've got several answers to that, uh, to that counter-argument. Uh, the first answer is that uh, these figures are a testament more to creative cosmetics than they are to any real improvement in the condition of the poor. There has been an enormous amount of monkey business with these figures. And I'll just give you one example, pretty much picked at random. I used to talk about the poverty statistics. Today, I want to talk about the hunger statistics, just to give you a sense of how much creativity goes into making these figures look good. So what they did was they formulated the goal already in the mid-1990s that they would have hunger by 2015. That was their big goal. And in the first version of the goal, in 1996, at the Rome Food Summit, they said we will have the number of hungry people from 788, which was the figure then, million of course, to 394. Four years later, when the number of hungry people had actually gone up in the interim, they said they would have the proportion of poor people, proportion in world population. And so that would reduce it from 833 in the year 2000 to 480 in the year 2015, and you can see that this raised the permissible number of hungry people in the year 2015 by 86 million. How? Very obvious, because the proportion is a ratio with the number of hungry people in the numerator, the uh, world's population in the denominator, and as the denominator increases, the ratio goes down quite by itself without any reduction in the number of hungry people. And so a good bit of the work that, according to the World Food Summit, was supposed to be done by reducing the number of hungry people is now done simply by increasing world population, which isn't really work at all. MDG1, again, uh, very much diluted the goal. It backdated the baseline to 1990 and also used the people in the developing countries as the denominator. So it's the proportion of people in the developing countries who suffer from hunger. Also, by backdating to 1990, you lengthen the time period in which population can grow. Population in the less developed countries grows faster anyway. And in addition, you are also availing yourself of the success that China had in the 1990s in poverty and hunger reduction. So why should all that go to waste? They did good work, so why not count it towards uh, the target? And so the new target here was 611 million hungry people. That's the permissible number for the year 2015. 
Now, how are we doing as of 2010, where we had 925 million hungry people? Well, if you go by the Rome Declaration, uh, hunger has gone up 17%. Rather than go down 50, it's gone up 17, very bad. If you go by the Millennium Declaration, hunger has gone up 2%, should have gone down 50%, you know, better, but still very bad. According to MDG1, hunger has declined 21% because of the fact that the population of the developing countries increased, and so even though the number of hungry people has increased since 1990, the proportion has decreased by 21%. Still not good, because after 80% of the period from 1990 to 2015, you should have achieved 80% of the goal, that is to say, you should have achieved a reduction of 40%. So what did our smart people do? Well, in 2012, the FAO, with some arm twisting from the World Bank and others, changed its methodology for counting the hungry. And with the new methodology, they found that the number of hungry people in 1990 was actually 157 million more than anybody had earlier suspected. And the number of hungry people in 2010 was actually 57 million less. And so obviously now we have a well <laughs> number sequence where the number of hungry has really gone down each and every year since 1990, never mind the doubling in food prices between 2006 and 2010. And here you see the result. Hunger has gone down by 36% now since 1990, and we are pretty much exactly on target. This is the infographics that the FAO published to celebrate its new methodology. The new methodology, by the way, is also wonderful in how it defines hunger. You have to go to page 50 and 51 to look for the small print in SOFI, the state of food insecurity in the world, and you will find that to count as undernourished, you have to satisfy three conditions, and uh, you won't believe me when I tell you what they are. The first one is uh, you have to have a shortfall of calories or energy. So any other shortfall in proteins or vitamins or anything, none of that is malnutrition or undernutrition. It has to be energy. Second, you have to fall short of the minimum requirements of a sedentary lifestyle. This is a quote. Uh, anything else doesn't matter. So uh, as you know, very, very few people in the developing world, very few poor people can afford the luxury of a sedentary lifestyle. These people work. Right? Not like I work in front of a computer, but they really work physically. So housewives, for example, don't have washing machines and dishwashers and all that sort of thing. They have to do an enormous amount of run around. They have to often fetch water from distant places and so forth. And uh, people do hard work in the fields and so on. So none of that matters to the FAO. The FAO says if you have the minimum requirements of a sedentary lifestyle, the minimum caloric requirements, you're not under nourish, you are fine. Now the third thing is, this condition of undernutrition, falling short of the minimal requirements of a sedentary lifestyle, has, has to last for over a year, otherwise it doesn't count. If it's just, you know, 11 months or something, no, 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 you're not under nourished, you're not hungry, no problem there. For over a year, and that means that, for example, there cannot be, biologically cannot be, a hungry rickshaw driver, right? because a rickshaw driver living off the minimum requirements for a sedentary lifestyle or below that would not last out the year, would never ever get to the end of that year given the caloric requirements that you actually have as a rickshaw driver. Anyway, so this is the kind of uh, elaborate uh, cosmetics that organizations like the FAO admittedly under pressure have to go through in order to get the right kind of trend figures for hunger, and similarly for other millennium development goals. So back to the counter-argument, right? The first response to the counter-argument is, uh, has there really been progress? I don't think we can be sure of that. There's certainly been progress in the official figures, but that's different from progress on the ground. Secondly, and that's very important to remember, much, much more would have been achieved for the poor and by the poor if merely they had kept pace 
with global economic growth. And I will show you some statistics about that a little later. So with all that heroic effort that everybody and their uncle and auntie supposedly made to eradicate poverty, they haven't even kept the poor in place in their relative share of global household income. The poor, poorest 30% lost considerable ground over that period since 1990. And last and most importantly, of course, what matters isn't whether there was progress or not. What matters is how much of the poverty that is left today is really unavoidable. Right? So think about uh, an analogy, think about slavery in this country. And suppose somebody had said in 1840, you know, what is the big deal about slavery? What are you so hung up about slavery for? Right? The slaves are better off than they were in 1820. The ripping apart of families has become less frequent. The raping of slaves is no longer so common. People don't get whipped so much anymore. So what's the big deal, right? There's progress. What we would have responded quite reasonably is to say that it doesn't really matter whether things are better than they were in 1820. What matters is how much worse they are than they could now be if only we abolished slavery. And the same thing we should say about poverty. Uh, how much better could things be if we now did what we must do in order to eradicate poverty? And this puts us in mind of the way in which poverty today is different from the poverty of your grandparents. So often we have the sentiment, poverty has always been there, get used to it, right? People die and people are poor. So these are two facts of life that mature people know how to cope with and know how to live with. Well, maybe for death, but not for poverty in the sense that poverty now is very different in that most of it is quite easily avoidable, and that wasn't the case two generations back. What we now have is a tremendous contrast between, on the one hand, the human costs of poverty, the human magnitude of the problem, which I showed you at the very beginning, and on the other hand, the economic magnitude of the problem, which is frankly chicken shit. It's really a small problem in economic terms. It's nothing like the global financial crisis. It's nothing like the Second World War, which gobbled up half the GNP of countries like the US and Great Britain and so on to fight the Nazis. Today, 2 or 3% of GNP would be all that's required to eradicate poverty once and for all. So in human terms, fully a third of all human deaths and more of a third of all human health deficits are due to poverty, and yet what the poorer half of humanity lacks is just barely 2% of global household income to bring them up to the level where at least they would no longer suffer these severe deprivations that I started out from. Now, why does poverty persist to such a high degree? I think a very important part of the answer is it is because of the way we've structured our social world, and in particular because of the supranational rules and regulations, the supranational institutional architecture, if you like, that we have constructed that is largely constructed by the rich and for the rich with very little attention for the needs and interests of poor people. So as I see it, uh, international law is here divided against itself. We have, on the one hand, a, the Sunday part of international law, which is full of high-sounding declarations about human rights and other laudable things. And on the other things, we ha on the other side, we have the uh, international law that governs our economic transactions, our financial system, our trading system, investment, and so on, which is uh, designed in such a way that it makes it very difficult if not impossible for the poorer parts of humanity, the poor majority, to keep up with global economic growth. And that is ultimately in violation of another human rights formulation that is also in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, famous Article 28, which says that everyone is entitled to a social and international order in which the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration can be fully realized. Now, this sort of order is now clearly possible given how much economic and technological advances have been made in the last 40, 60 years. But we still don't have an order that achieves that objective. Now, here's another counter-argument. Uh, this is a counter-argument that is especially often 
and gleefully repeated in The Economist magazine. And the argument goes like this. It says that, yes, poverty persists. There's a lot of poverty still around in the world. But it can't have anything to do with our global institutional architecture. And you know why? Because countries differ dramatically in the evolution of poverty. In some countries that used to be very poor, poverty has very rapidly disappeared. South Korea, for example, and other countries where poverty used to be no worse than in South Korea in the 1950s, poverty still persists. So these very large discrepancies in the evolution of poverty of different countries prove beyond a reasonable doubt that local factors must be to blame for the persistence of poverty where it persists. Now that argument is very popular and it sounds very plausible on the surface, but it is still a non sequitur. And I want to show you quickly why. What the argument clearly shows is that local factors play a role. It can't be all global factors, because if it were all global factors, then the course of evolution would be the same in all these different countries, surely. But the fact that this divergence shows only that local factors play a role. It doesn't show at all that global factors don't play a role. And to drive that home, uh, take this example, right? I teach courses at Yale, and there, unlike at Rutgers, there are great discrepancies in student success at the end of term. So some of my students learn a lot, others learn very little. And does that prove or does it not that the quality of the teacher is irrelevant to student success? Well, not exactly, right? So clearly, if I were a better teacher, the students would learn more. If I were an even worse teacher, they would learn less. But also some of the differences in student performance are due to the teacher. So for example, the materials that I use or the teaching style that I use may be more uh, hospitable to some students and less hospitable to others. So that students who are in fact doing poorly would have done much better if I had used fewer numbers in pie charts and had sort of done more with long-winded winded sentences. Conversely, some of the students who uh, did well with the pie charts would have done worse if I had used the long-winded sentence method. So uh, in that way, too, the teacher can influence even the discrepancies in student success. And finally, some of the student-specific factors, the very local factors like motivation, for example, can also be influenced by the students, so by the teacher. So if a teacher is a sexist, for example, carries sexist jokes, that will turn off a whole bunch of students who will say, well, if he's that anti-diluvian in that respect, then I don't really think I've got a lot to learn from this creature, even in other respects, right? And so I tune out and so forth. So motivation, too, is something that is influenced by the teacher and by the... So in all these different ways, uh, the mere fact that there are sharp discrepancies in performance don't or doesn't show that the global factor teacher or the global factor institutional order of the world or supranational institutions is irrelevant. So let's look at some of those institutional factors that are relevant, just a few to give you a sense of what I have in mind and what might matter. These institutional factors at the supranational level work in two ways. They work to some extent directly and to some extent indirectly by influencing the institutional arrangements in national societies in which poverty then persists. They favor, for example, bad governance in developing countries. So one is protectionism. That's everybody's favorite. From the right wing of the political spectrum to the left wing, everybody's against protectionism, except it's still uh, seems to persist and survive in some way. Protectionism is this grandfathering in of various uh, market barriers that especially go to the detriment of poor countries. So it's agriculture and textiles in particular which are not allowed to uh, come into the rich countries from the developing world. Uh, they are shut out by tariffs, quotas, anti-dumping duties, subsidies, uh, export credits, and so on, that on the one hand make it hard to export into the rich countries and also make it difficult to export at all because we, with our subsidized products, are uh, flooding world markets in ways that poor countries cannot compete with because they can't afford to match our subsidies. 
And just to give you a sense, in many countries, the farmer's income is more than 50% subsidies. Norway is an example, since I see large there in the audience. Norway, it's 56%, for example. The 56% of farmers' income is just sheer subsidies from the state. Pharmaceuticals, right? We have a one-size-fits-all patent regime now that was made a condition of membership in the WTO. And what it says is that all countries, including developing countries, have to grant 20-year uh, product patents to new pharmaceuticals which make it impossible for generic companies to invent around, as they could do with process patents, to invent around the way of making a product, making a new medicine, and uh, they could then sell it cheaply to patients in India and other developing countries. That door has closed with the TRIPS agreement, which requires that product patents be issued, which don't allow for any reason anybody else to make the same molecule. The result of that is, of course, that poor people have to wait 15, 20 years if they live that long to get access to the new medicines. Pollution rules, well, they benefit for the most part the rich. Pollution benefits the rich. The consumption is overwhelmingly in the richer countries. And the greatest vulnerabilities are among the poor. For example, among the people in the Philippines who recently had that typhoon, they're poor, they live in very flimsily constructed dwellings that, of course, get uh, wiped out by a typhoon like that, and they suffer disproportionately the effects of the climate change that we, through our pollution, uh, engender. Illicit financial flows, I've been working on that recently. It's been a much larger problem than I ever realized. Something in the order of $1 trillion is sucked out of developing countries each year, but eight times as much as all the development assistance taken together that flows in is sucked out, for example, through embezzlement, where politicians and officials take money and then bury it in Western banks where they can keep it secret in the US, in the UK, in the Channel Islands, and various other tax havens and secrecy jurisdictions. And even larger in terms of quantity is all the money that multinational corporations are sucking out of poor countries uh, through unfair resource extraction agreements and also through the fact that they simply don't pay taxes, right? You think that they pay no taxes in the US, that's true, many of them, but they also don't pay taxes in the poor countries. And uh, generally speaking, they pay very little taxes, if any, and the way in which they avoid paying taxes is very simple by dividing the division of labor over their various subsidiaries in such a way that the profits accumulate in those jurisdictions where the taxes on profits are least or non-existent. So to give a very, very stylized, simple example, right? if you have subsidiaries in every single country in the world, or more or less every country in the world, and you produce in some country and sell in another, let's call them India and South Africa, uh, you will first produce in India, then sell at a very low price to your subsidiary in the Bahamas, then at a high price to your subsidiary in South Africa, and thereby avoid having a profit either in India because you sold so cheaply, and or to have a profit in South Africa because you bought expensively from the Bahamas. All your profit is in the Bahamas where your goods never went to, where you don't have any employees really except that one lawyer who is also taking care of 75 other multinationals at the same time. And it's an invoicing trick, right? And so you accumulate these huge amounts of profit in the tax havens where you don't have to pay taxes on the profits. So the trick is basically you find a million different ways in which you dissipate profit, make sure that you don't have profit in those countries in which there is a tax on profit. You hire expensive consulting, consulting services from another subsidiary of the same multinational in Switzerland, say, where these don't get taxed. You sell your trademark to the Netherlands subsidiary and then rent it back at a very high price so that you again dissipate profits, and so on and so on. These illicit financial flows also breed corruption and civil wars in many of the developing countries because it is just so very lucrative to get a position in these countries as a politician or official that people will go to extraordinary lengths to secure such a position. <coughs> 
The four privileges have a similar effect. It's basically the privileges that we assign to any person or group that exercises effective power in a country. We say that any such power holder is entitled to confer legally valid ownership rights in natural resources, can sell the resources of the country, and can also borrow in the name of the country. And these privileges, on the one hand, impoverish the country's population, and on the other hand, increase the staying power of the regime in power. And thereby also, again, breed repression, corruption, and civil war insofar as, again, very strong incentives are created for taking power by force, right? Any general in the developing world knows that if only he manages somehow to occupy the presidential power palace and take power by force, then he will be recognized by everybody in the world as entitled to sell the country's resources and to borrow money in the name of the whole country. The arms trade further supports that because one thing that these people do with the money that they get their hands on by taking over by force is they can buy arms, thereby equip a paid army and keep themselves in power regardless of what the population may think of them. Labor standards finally are not in any way fixed by our international agreements, so it's interesting how we all insist on having very elaborate rules about how intellectual property has to be regulated and protected the world over. But with regard to labor rights, we are totally leaving every country totally free to do whatever they want with regard to labor rights, which predictably leads to a race to the bottom where the different developing countries compete with each other in offering ever more exploitable and mistreatable workforces to international investors. So these are some of the features of our supranational institutional order that are clearly designed to benefit uh, important agents such as banks, hedge funds, multinationals, industry associations, and so on, and are clearly working to the detriment of poor people. That raises the next question, how is it or why is it that the supranational institutional architecture is so hostile to the poor? Why does it make it so very, very difficult for the poor to keep up with global economic growth. And here I think the central piece of the answer is regulatory capture, which is a term that is very well introduced and very well known among social scientists for 50 or so years and mainly gets used in the national context. Regulatory capture is a phenomenon that people in the US know better than anyone because we see it pretty much every day that people descend upon Washington and buy themselves rules and regulations and applications of such rules and regulations uh, for our own profit, for our own corporations. So corporations have lots of lobbyists that are doing their work in Washington. They give campaign contributions to Congress people, senators, politicians. They hire for very, very high salaries as consultants, people who were earlier in charge of regulating that very same industry, thereby signaling to people who are still in the regulation business that if they behave themselves, they will also be hired at high salaries, the so-called revolving door phenomenon. And so there are all these various ways in which in the US regulatory capture is uh, practiced. And in regulatory capture, of course, the strongest participants, those who are already wealthy and influential, have a big advantage over those who are relatively poor. To give an example, right, uh, philosophers would benefit from a special lower tax rate for philosophers. And if you reduce that by 10% or something from currently 35 to 25 or whatever, uh, we'd all you know, get $10,000 more, $8,000 more, whatever it is, but that's not a lot of money by Washington standards, and so it would take 5,000 philosophers or so to have the requisite critical mass to descend upon Washington with an offer that they couldn't refuse. <laughs> now, getting 5,000 philosophers to agree on anything is <laughs> obviously going to be pretty difficult, but just to give you the comparison, right? think of hedge fund managers. If hedge fund managers, they would save maybe a million or two million in taxes each from a favorable thing. And so three or four hedge fund managers could pull off what it takes 5,000 philosophers to pull off, namely to gather enough to have a rational reason to go to Washington and, uh, and lobby for a different uh, set of tax rules. 
And I submit that that's a large part of the reason why we actually do have a special tax rate for hedge fund managers and we don't have a special tax rate for philosophers. Hedge fund managers pay 15% maximum, whereas philosophy professors and waitresses and everybody else pays, I think, 35 or 39.6 in the near future. Right, so uh, the rich, the influential have the critical mass. It's easier for them to organize. They have more experience, more knowledge, better connections. So in many different ways, they advantage in this game of regulatory capture. And that means that as they capture the rules successfully, thereby increasing their share of household income, they are then in the next round even better able to capture the rules and so on. So there is the danger of an inequality spiral where at each round of the game, the rich and advantaged add uh, to economic inequalities and political inequalities in their own favor. Now here are two examples about this sort of lobbying game. And one that you learn something useful for a change in this evening. So one is the strategist investment research firm, uh, they did an index. And so they, you know what the S&P 500 are, right? So the S&P 500, the 500 largest companies in the US, and they say, look, what you should do is you should every quarter invest all your money in the 50 companies out of the 500 that spend the most on lobbying relative to their assets. So call that the 50 lobbying, the big lobbying companies, right? And each quarter, you repeat. If the companies haven't changed, you leave your money where it is. If they have changed, you pull it out of those that are no longer lobbying so hard and put it into those that are now the hardest lobbyists. Now, how would you have done if you had done that, if you had followed that strategy? Well, The Economist magazine is reporting the answer. You would have done bloody well. What you see here is the S&P 500 went nowhere, as we all know, from 2001 to 2011, whereas the strategist 50, the f subset of 50 companies of this 500, uh, had a gain of 250%, did vastly better than the S&P 500. So that's pretty impressive. Lobbying really does pay. Here's another... Uh, the light blue is the relative performance. So the dark blue is the actual performance, and the light blue is basically the, uh, these two curves relative to each other. So how much better the outperformance. And so that's why it's a much smoother curve, because the, the big movements are, of course, affecting both indices. Now, another uh, bit of uh, lobbying evidence is it's normally hard to tell how much money you get out of your lobbying, right? It's hard to get a ratio of how much you invest versus how much you get out. But sometimes it's possible, and here is a case where it was possible, where three economists did the math. This is the wonderfully titled American Jobs Creation Act of 2004. And the act basically, the point of the act is this. I told you the story about how multinational corporations don't pay taxes. The problem with that method is that they accumulate lots of money in tax havens, and that money cannot easily be repatriated into the US because when you do repatriate it, you do have to pay taxes in the US. And so what these companies do is they accumulate money in tax havens until it becomes a lot, and then they go to the Congress and say, look, we love America, we are patriots, we want to create jobs in America, please don't prevent us from doing it by charging us taxes. Let us bring this money home and give us a tax holiday. A tax holiday is a short period where you can bring money home at a discount. And so the discount in this case of the American Jobs Creation Act was 85%. So instead of 35%, the normal corporate tax rate, these guys paid 5.25%. And so, since we know from their corporate reports how much money they spent on lobbying for that act, we can calculate the ratio of how much money did they save in taxes for every dollar that they invested for lobbying. And the ratio is 221. They say 220 in the article, but it's actually 221 if you do the math. So they got $221 back for every dollar invested. And that, again, is a pretty impressive rate of return, uh, not 220%, but actually 
So that's regulatory capture or examples thereof. Now, there's one thing new. Regulatory capture is the second oldest profession, but uh, there is something new in regulatory capture, and that is that you now have a whole new ball game where you can practice regulatory capture, and that is the ball game of supranational institutional arrangements that have exploded since the 1980s, mid-1980s, when globalization came into full force. And so now there is a great deal of lobbying going on with the objective of influencing governments, not with respect to domestic legislation, but with respect to international legislation. And that is particularly lucrative for three reasons. More lucrative, more easy actually to do than domestic lobbying for three reasons. One is there's no democratic counterweight. So there are, isn't that you have to deal with or contend with or struggle against ordinary people who might have their own ideas about what the country should do and their own interests to defend. Democracy is pretty much unheard of at the supranational level. Secondly, there's little transparency. We just saw, did you see that the WikiLeaks, WikiLeaks leaked a whole chapter of the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which has been negotiated behind closed doors for several years. And uh, that is, again, is highly interesting that, first of all, we don't get access to these things until they get adopted by countries. And we have to rely on WikiLeaks. Lobbyists, of course, have access to the text. But ordinary citizens cannot get hold of this text and don't know what their countries are negotiating on their behalf. And even exposed, even after the treaty has been published, it's very difficult, if not impossible, for anybody to find out how this treaty got written, right? Who pushed for what? Who wanted this formulation, or how did this get into the treaty, and so on? And thirdly, in the international realm, moral restraints are more easily dispelled, because you can say, look, international relations are a jungle, and we are moral. We would like to have more moral rules, but we are competing against the Chinese, and you know what? The Chinese are not moral. The Chinese are now in Africa, and they are there not for the interest of the Africans, but for their own interests. It's a scandal, but I have to tell you it's true. And so sad as it may be, we, the Americans or whoever, have to also fight without one hand tied behind our backs, because we are competing with the Chinese. And of course, the Chinese laugh and say, look, you know, the Europeans and the Americans have been in Africa much longer than we have. And you think they were there for the interests of the Africans? Not exactly. So we have to fight uh, with no moral restraints because we are competing with the Americans and the Europeans. Blah, blah, blah. So the most cost-effective lobbying these days is this lobbying over supranational arrangements. You still lobby the same people in your own government, but you lobby it with regard not to national legislation and rules, but with regard to international. <coughs> rules and you lobby for the shifting upward of rules and regulations where they can most easily be influenced without the distractions of publicity, democracy, accountability, transparency, and so on. And here the US, of course, is the softest target because the US, on the one hand, is of the serious governments the one that is most for sale. And it's also still the dominant power in these international negotiations. You can see here uh, quite interesting evidence about the US household income distribution, how it evolved. So if you look at just the latest period, 78 to 2007, you see an explosion in inequality, in particular at the very top, right? Our friends of Occupy Wall Street often talk about the richest 1% and we are the 99% and so on. But if you look more closely, it's actually the top tenth or even the top one hundredth of one percent that is really, really making the big gains. So they went up by 602 percent in their share of national household income between 78 and 07, going from 0.86 to 6.04 percent of national household income. These are 30,000 people, one hundredth of one percent, and these 30,000 people now have half as much income as the bottom half of Americans, 156 million people, and they have more income 
than the bottom 35% of the world's population, which are 2.5 billion people. So 30,000 in the US have more income than 2.5 billion people who are the poorest in the world. So a tremendous shift in the income distribution to the detriment of pretty much everybody else in the United States. Uh, the other 90 uh, percentiles below have lost during that period. Look also at how this was by no means a trend, a long-term trend, right? During 28 to 78, equality in the United States increased, inequality decreased, and it came down to a pretty reasonable level. And then with the Reagan-Thatcher revolution and globalization, inequality reversed course and has now exceeded the level where it was just before the Great Depression. Now globally, we find something similar. We didn't have as fine-grained data globally as we do thanks to the IRS for the country. But you can see here the, the basic drift. I told you earlier that the bottom 30% of the human population, the bottom three deciles, lost ground over the period of the MDGs. They would have done much better, much better, had they only kept pace with global economic growth. And you can also see where the winners are. Right, The, the big winner is the richest 5%. They captured an extra 3% of global household income. But there are winners also in the sixth and seventh uh, decile, which are basically countries that, like China, for example, the middle class in China, they had tremendous gains there in that, in that area. It's a bit more bunched than it would be in the real world, because Milanovic, who is the source of these figures, he divides each country into ventiles, which are 20th of the population and treats each ventile as one observation, so he doesn't differentiate within ventiles. Here is the same information in uh, visual form, maybe easier to, to see. This is what happened over that period of exactly 20 years from 1988 to 2008. What you can see is the top 5% of the world's population had a major gain, partly at the expense of the next 15%. And the second and third quintiles did better. They actually improved their position. And the fourth and fifth quintile, and in particular the fifth quintile lost. The fifth quintile lost well over 20% of its share of global household income. So key facts. In 20 years, the richest 5% gained more, namely almost 3% of global household income, than the poorer half had left at the, at the end of the period. So everything the poorer half had at the end of the period was just as much as the gain of the richest 5%. If the poorest 30% had held steady, they would be 21% better off. And finally, most importantly, if the 3% that in fact was captured by the top 5% of the world's population had been captured by the bottom half of the human population, poverty would already be history now. The bottom half now has 3.33% of global household income. If they had 6.3%, that would be perfectly enough to prevent and avoid all these big deprivations that I told you about at the very beginning of this talk. This is what it would look like, by no means a threat to the wealth and welfare of the top 5%. You would just make the bottom two quintiles as large as the middle quintile is now, roughly speaking, and you would have wiped out that life-threatening, really horrific poverty that we saw in the beginning. So I conclude then with the following thought, that most people think of poverty and people in the developing countries and so on as pretty much at the bottom of our, our moral priority list. So we say that the most important duties that we have as citizens and our government has are duties, negative duties to our compatriots. We mustn't violate the human rights of our compatriots, for example, by uh, things like uh, unreasonable searches and seizures, uh, imprisonment without trial, torture, and so on and so forth. Then come positive duties to our compatriots. They're less important, but still important to help them, to be solidaric, to support them, and so on. 
And then at the very end come positive duties that we owe to foreigners. They're even less important. They're really sort of a distant third in that hierarchy of duties. Now, what I want to say is that what we have left out here in this hierarchy are the negative duties that we owe to foreigners, namely not to harm them. That's recognized sometimes when we think about aggressive war, for example, but we rarely think and should think much more about the, the harm that we do to distant foreigners by, through our government, imposing institutional arrangements on the world that clearly, foreseeably, and avoidably cause a great deal of poverty and misery the world over. And in fact, these negative duties to foreigners, I think, are pretty much as important as negative duties to compatriots. So I'm willing to allow that there is a differentiation between foreigners and compatriots with regard to positive duties, that maybe we have more reason to help Americans than we have to help foreigners. But when it's a matter of harming, I don't think that difference actually exists. So if you think about, is it wrong to drive drunk where you uh, are endangering people? Well, it's wrong to do that in America where you endanger American citizens. But I think it's just as wrong to do that in Belize or in Romania, where you are maybe in an area where the only people running around the streets are non-Americans. Right? It's, I don't think it's a valid excuse to say, well, I drove drunk, but I did it where I knew there wouldn't be any Americans around. So if that's right, then this is a double upgrading of the importance of the poverty in the developing world. On the one hand, you upgrade it from positive duty to negative duty status, you're saying that we are actually involved in harming these people. And secondly, you're saying that when it is a matter of harming, then the fact that they are foreigners actually doesn't make a real difference to the stringency of the moral duty to cease and desist from that harm. So the obligations that would be affected by this upgrade are two. On the one hand, the obligation to work towards reform to work through our governments, press for revisions and reforms in institutional arrangements that will end the way in which these arrangements are skewed in favor of the rich, that will end the disadvantages that institutional arrangements impose upon the poor. And secondly, insofar as we can, to compensate for our fair share of the harm that we together do. And this is where the giving what we can movement, I think, comes into its own, that we say, instead of thinking of our obligation towards the poor and the kind of giving that giving what we can encourages in terms of positive duties, here we are reasonably well off, there are these other people much worse off than we are, and we could, without giving up something very significant, we could do something quite significant for them. Instead of only thinking about that, idea, which of course is a perfectly valid idea, we should also think about the idea that we are actually in many ways through our government making their situation worse. We are blowing a strong headwind into their faces, if you like, and making it hard for them, if not impossible, even just to maintain their relative share of global household income. And we should compensate for that and compensate for the benefits that we derive through that skewed international order by giving up some of our possessions and our wealth in favor of protecting them from the harms in whose production we are also playing a material part. So that's it. I look forward to discussing all this more with you in due course. Uh, thank you very much for your lecture. I enjoyed it and found it very fascinating. Um, so it seems that there's a, a lot of different levels that you can look at this issue, and, and uh, I know we have a lot of data on relative inequality of classes for the U.S. because of our detailed statistics, so my question is primarily directed at that. Um, so as far as uh, the duties we have as citizens to support the government and to you know pay for welfare and things like that that help people at the bottom, um, I guess I question the, the, the premise that the rich are doing, I guess, less than their fair share of that, just based on uh, amount of tax burden paid. So if these are, figures are from a few years ago. Uh, the top 1% paid 40% of the tax burden, the top 5% paid 60%, top 10% paid 71%, and, and thus, for the top 50% paid 90% of the tax burden. 
So I suppose there's there's definitely other issues you could look at, um, multinational and, and, and uh, how that plays out in different countries and tax shelters and all that. But it seems to me that as far as uh, the majority of income that is made in the U.S. and then also consumed and spent and taxed in the U.S., that the rich are paying, I would say, you know, close to what they would deserve to, or maybe possibly more, depending on your perspective on that. Yeah, so the, I mean, this is a difficult topic, but the presumption uh, underlying what you said is that the gross incomes that people have are a true reflection of their contribution to the economy. Right? And then, because only then is it meaningful to say that what they pay in taxes reflects, so to speak, their contribution to the social product or something like that. And that, of course, is a highly contestable presumption that uh, the gross salaries reflect what each person contributes to the economy. So you're saying that the tax their incomes are actually larger than what is taxed or what is shown, so they're paying less than what is here? Uh, no, the, uh, I'm saying that the, that gross incomes are not necessarily a reflection on. Let me give an example. Maybe that makes it clearer, right? So let's say you take somebody who owns a large chunk of land and is renting that land out or allowing that land to be used, and so gets income from that land. And so what you are saying is, well, this land is belongs to that person, and that's his contribution to the economy. And that contribution is valued at fair market prices. People are bidding to use that land, and the highest bidder gets to use the land. And uh, so that reflects the person's contribution. And then we can see the taxes that the person pays on that income. And these taxes reflect what the person is giving uh, back to society, so to speak, for social purposes. And that's a lot of money, because he makes a lot of money off the land and gives so now a critic would say, well, look, the very rule that somebody can earn, can own very large tracts of land and can rent those out and can get income from them, that rule is a rule that isn't natural in any way. It's not sort of a rule that God made or that was always in existence. I mean, it's a, it's a way in which we have organized our society. We could have organized our society differently in such a way that large tracts of land are not ownable or that they are uh, not ownable for any length of time, only for 90 years or something, and then it goes back to the state or something. So resources, land, you might say, belong to all human beings in common. God gave the world to everybody, and so we shouldn't have a system where one person can own a very large tract of land and then claim all the income that the land generates as his own, and so to speak, hold others over a barrel and say, if you want to use this land, if you want to have any part of this, then you will have to pay me uh, the fair rental value for that land. Right? And so you have to look at the entire system of rules uh, together. You can't just assume that whatever gross salary or gross income a person makes under an existing set of rules is really that person's contribution. And what the person then pays out of that gross income in taxes is therefore something that that person is forking over to the collective. Right? Because the, the rules themselves, how we design these rules uh, itself has a very, very strong distributive effect. Yeah, I guess I can see how it would depend on your accepting of the, the kind of property and the current state of the house. Right, right. And so you have to look at the whole system together, the property rules and so forth, combined with the tax rules, and then judge the whole system and see how much inequality it generates and so forth. Good. I was wondering, uh, somewhere along the line, you said that it would take like two to three percent of GMP to eradicate um, all of poverty. I guess I was wondering two things. First, you know, say that lump sum, you know, became available. All countries, you know, sort of, you know, uh, came together and said, you know, we want to put this stash aside. So A, you know, would it then be as simple as just applying, you know, some good principles to use that and then that would eradicate poverty? And then B, I was just wondering, like charities over time, it seems like there's been a ton of money. Is that, has that ever amassed the amount that would eradicate poverty? And I guess the example that comes to mind is like the Bill Gates Foundation um, is the amount of money he's pouring into things you know, enough to really make a difference. 
Yeah, so two things on that. Uh, the first is that I would not want to say that the best way to do it is to collect that money and then to spend it on poverty eradication. That's exactly the thinking I want to get away from, right? So what we now have is we have a very elaborate international institutional architecture with all sorts of rules and regulations. And one tiny little part of that, somewhere in the niche corner, is uh, poverty eradication through development assistance and NGOs. That's a minuscule little part of the world economy. And what I'm saying is we should mainstream the concern for the poor. We should not sort of pump more money into that corner even though it might help to some extent, but we should rather redesign the rest of this architecture in such a way that it is not so hostile and detrimental to the poor. So when I talked about the 2%, it was not really that I was advocating that we should collect that money from the rich and give it to the poor, but I was advocating that we, the richer, should be willing to bear the opportunity costs, right? We can be as strong enough to lobby for rules that favor us over the poor. But rather than do that, we should work towards just and fair rules that do not disadvantage the poor, even if that means that under those juster and fairer rules, we'll get a slightly smaller share. That would be the idea. So there wouldn't be that problem. Now, what you say about development assistance and NGO work and so on, I agree with you that a lot of that is not very useful and has been quite ineffective. And if you think about it, it's not terribly surprising, right? Because the people who are in charge of these efforts are, for the most part, more interested in themselves than they are in poverty eradication. And so if you give a government a certain amount of money and say, well, spend that money on development assistance, what they would actually do is to spend it on pleasing uh, political cronies in the developing world, people who they need to vote for them on this or that, or on pleasing companies in their own country with exports. So they say to, to a developing country, right, if you want to buy certain things from our company, blah, 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 we will be willing to subsidize that or to support it with our development assistance and so on. So again, they will do it in a way that will gain them favors in return from powerful agents rather than trying to benefit very weak agents as the poor normally are. So development assistance hasn't worked too well on the whole, right, with some exceptions, and also all that NGO stuff hasn't worked all that well. There are tons and tons of NGOs that are pretty much ineffective. There are some that are extremely good. And I should mention in this context that uh, giving what we can in conjunction with givewell.org, they are doing very careful research on which organizations are actually effective and which ones aren't. So one big mistake that many people make is they measure their contribution to poverty eradication in the developing world by how much they give, rather than by how much of what they give is actually achieving in the world. So it's crucial to give to the right organization because even if you give $500 or $600 to some no good organization that is just paying its CEOs and uh, its executives and so on and so forth, you haven't done anything for poverty, right? You have sacrificed something, but sacrificed for nothing. So that's crucially important. Uh, thank, thank you for coming today. And um, my question is that uh, the organization of the exploitation of the poor that you showed me, uh, brings to mind a, what I think is probably a naive question, but uh, are there individuals, organizations, or perhaps ideologies that um, are perpetrators of this? And is it malicious, or is it largely accidental? Is it just the way that it happens to be? Or is, is this somehow an in, like an intentional, organized effort to exploit the poor? I think by and large not. By and large this is uh, unintended. And what it is is essentially that the people who have the possibility to lobby, to influence, right? These people are fighting in the first instance against each other. These rules are very, very contested. And so they're winners and losers even among the elites. Even very big, powerful people, conglomerates, 
industry associations lose sometimes, right? So there's the pharma industry against the insurance companies and so on. A big battle, and who will win? And they both spend enormous amounts on lobbying and so on. And uh, it's sort of two elephants struggling, and they don't pay a lot of attention to the ants that are on the ground. They get crushed, but nobody really intends any harm to the ants. Nobody cares about the ants. And so very often in these matters, uh, there isn't even any careful study done about how that would affect the poor. And so often it is actually with, with a certain amount of justification that people that afterwards say, well, really? So the structural adjustment programs that we institute in Africa, they really hurt children? Oh, sorry, we just didn't know, we never realized, and so on. You know, sometimes, of course, you say, well, they should have realized that the very most minimal due diligence would have made them realize it. But I think very often uh, it is not something that even is within their field of vision. And this, again, suggests what we should do, right? We should insist that when important agreements are made, during the discussion phase, there should be people who are advocates of the poor who, at least in a way that is impartial, are working out what the consequences of this would be. Suppose we go down this route, how is that going to impact poor people? Or this route, how is it going to, which of the two is going to have what consequences? So in writing, write this up and so that reputations really get hurt when distinguished economists who are hired to do this sort of a job make predictions that are clearly serving the interests of the rich and so forth. So, but I think by and large, uh, this is not maliciousness, this is simply self-love, right? Trying to do the best I can for myself and my company, my industry, and so on, what I get paid for, and then the consequence of that is harmful to the poor. Hi. Um, so I'm hearing all this, and uh, here I really, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm taking this message really to, uh, my field is uh, cultural anthropology, so uh, I'm analyzing this from a little bit of a different perspective, but um, you know, the, the, according to the statistics presented, there's a, a significant stratification between the tax payments between the rich and poor, um, et cetera. Uh, would you say that um, there should be a more bottom-up model implemented or a top-down model implemented with regards to uh, fixing uh, these problems uh, specifically? Um, in other words, should, should it start in a social sphere? Or should it start uh, based on uh, economics? Or uh, the two are ultimately intertwined, but um, uh, for example, one country may have a, a much uh, lower or uh, um, much, much less disparate uh, tax payments between the rich and poor. Whereas in the US, it's great disparity between, you know, you mentioned 15% versus 35%, or third, soon to be 39.6. Uh, so, um, in countries that there's a much smaller gap in between what the rich and poor are paying in taxes, uh, do you think that the um, uh, inequality spirals are uh, should be necessarily concentrated in the area of uh, should those inequality spirals be necessarily concentrated in the area of uh, um, understanding people's uh, backgrounds with regard to uh, how they stand culturally, or should it start from their economic status? Yes, I'm not 100% clear on the question, but I'll, I'll say a few things and see whether uh, it's responsive, and if not, feel free to, to come back. So I think the, uh, there are, there's sort of a bit of both in, in my thinking. On the one hand, <coughs> What I am mostly focusing on are very large-scale institutional structures, so things that the rules that govern trade, govern investment, uh, and finance internationally. And these rules, uh, intellectual property rights, labor standards, uh, how to deal with climate change, and so on, these very big pieces of the international institutional architecture uh, cannot really be designed because they are global or supranational pieces, cannot really be designed with careful attention to the cultural traditions and individual preferences of particular populations. But on the other hand, you can, in, for example, tracking how institutions work and what effects they have, 
uh, you can go down to the local level and think or talk with people, talk with poor people themselves. So this is a very important uh, activity to work out what their priorities are and where they think the greatest problems lie, what they think is going wrong in their lives or in their communities. So one thing I did recently, just finished, is a three-year project on how to poverty, how to conduct poverty measurement. What, uh, how does one track poverty if one doesn't want to use the simple-minded World Bank methodology of just counting the number of people living below a dollar twenty-five per person per day, right? So, if uh, what are the various dimensions of poverty? How important are they? Which increments in these various dimensions are more important? Which increments are less important, and so on. And so we did that through a series of three rounds of discussions with people in particular sites across six developing countries, 18 sites, and thereby got a, a reasonable metric or measure going, the individual deprivation measure as we called it, which gives us a sense of how things are working, whether they are working or and how they are working. And that is something that's essential when you make these very large scale uh, institutional reforms to see whether they actually improve conditions on the ground or not. Right? So even though these institutions cover large numbers of people in many different countries and even continents, you do want to keep track of how they actually work out on the ground in various uh, situations. Another project that I'm now uh, beginning is a project about illicit financial flows, the stuff that I briefly mentioned in the lecture. And there too, we have various reform ideas, and we want to test them and see how they would actually work. If uh, you know what other priorities, what would have the best impact uh, on capital flight, revenue drainage, and so on in various developing countries. So I think you have to constantly look at large-scale institutional factors, but also at their footprint on the ground in local communities and so forth. Involved. So that's neither bottom up nor top down really, but it's a kind of combination between the two. Is that sort of roughly responsive to what you're asking? Yes, thank you. Good, thanks. Hello, sir. Um, My question has to do with the uh, WTO um, rules and regulations that disenfranchise developing countries. and whether deregulations in those laws would benefit them just as much or even more than, say, contributing 3% of the world GDP to developing countries. Um, an example I could cite is um, in Iran, where despite well, crushing sanctions and other economic restrictions that they've had, they've been able to find um, markets in, say, India for their pharmaceutical companies and um, other markets in, say, Russia and Venezuela for their um, auto industry. I personally have seen, surprisingly, like Iranian cars in Russia. So how would that kind of deregulation benefit developing countries? Yeah, so deregulation would be, would here be what? Would be that Iranian products are being accepted as pharmaceuticals, yes. Um, yeah. Pharmaceuticals that don't have specific patents that follow the kind of regulations that the mm -hmm. WTO has are being sold in markets such as in India. Right. Yeah, so if you had total deregulation in the pharmaceutical markets, for example, which is one big topic that I work on with the Health Impact Fund project, so if you had total deregulation there, the problem is that you would not get uh, the same incentives for developing new products. So pharmaceutical markets are pretty unique, pretty unusual, in that the cost of producing the first item is very, very high. So if you want it to be tested properly through clinical trials, where you test it on thousands of people to make sure that it's safe and effective, right? Somebody has to undergo that labor, has to pay the cost for that, which uh, is in the hundreds of millions. And that somebody, is not going to do that unless they get some sort of reward. Because if at the end of the day, they get to sell the product, competing with anybody else who wants to make the same molecule, which is easy to retro-engineer, then of course, uh, if you are the one who did all the research and development, uh, you will go bankrupt, right? Because you're competing with these other guys who can make the stuff just as cheaply as you can.
and you will not make a profit because you can't add much to the cost of the product in the price because as soon as you do, you will be undersold by these other guys. In other words, you never get your research and development expenses covered. You never get the money back. So that's the problem, and so deregulation doesn't work here. In the pharmaceutical industry, uh, any kind of free market would lead to disaster because free market means anybody can compete with you. So you need to do something in order to reward innovators if you want to have innovation, which we definitely want and need. And so the right way to do that, I think, is not through markups, allowing people to charge high prices for a temporary period, let's say, during which you have a patent, but the right way to do that is to give people rewards based on the health impact of the innovation. So you say that out of public funds, we will pay to those who invent and develop and bring to market a new medicine, we will pay them an amount of money that is proportional to the health impact that this medicine achieves in the world, something of that sort. So that wouldn't be exactly deregulation, but it would be a different way of regulating. So in general, I think, the, the general point that you make with that terminological change included is one that I would fully support. I would say that the solution here is not to shell out money to give 3% of world product to the poor or anything like that. There you have leaky bucket problems, corruption problems, etc., etc. But the right way to do it is just to design the rules with careful attention to how they impact the poor and make sure that the rules are sufficiently favorable to poor populations that they can, on their own, uh, participate in global economic growth and, if possible, actually uh, over-participate, so to speak, get a disproportionate share of global economic growth so that there is slow but steady convergence where the poor catch up and inequalities between rich and poor decline. Not through diverting money from the top to the bottom, but by having rules under which the economy operates that are more favorable to the poor. I think we have time for one last question. Um, so my question is in relation to the financial crisis and the, the way in which perhaps the U.S. government structure affects this super, super national uh, schema. So for instance, um, with financial crisis, when we have companies that view their positive obligations to stockholders or to uh, corporate board executives as outweighing or supervening upon negative obligations to foreigners, for instance, um, about you know CEOs not caring whether or not global economies plunge into crisis versus themselves making billions of dollars. What, what sort of systemic way or yeah, what sort of systemic way do you think we can introduce moral obligations to sort of override financial incentives that continue to dominate uh, the production of policy? Yeah, so as you, as you indicate, there are basically two ways of doing that, right? One way is uh, a change in culture where executives are more morally minded and stockholders are more morally minded and they sort of understand that it's part and parcel of investing in a company. You expect the company that you are a shareholder in to make certain sacrifices to behave morally. Just like I behave morally with my money, right, that I have somebody to whom I rented my apartment or something, I would not kick that person out when that person, through no fault of their own, uh, is late with the rent one day or something like that, or when I can find somebody who pays a little bit more, which this person cannot pay. And so similarly, uh, the executives of a company that act in behalf of the shareholders should not uh, reckon that the shareholders want to play such a cruel game and they should be moral in behalf of the shareholders and so on. So that would be a change in culture that's a little bit different from what we have now, where often the executives are seeing themselves as being obligated to the shareholders to squeeze out every last dollar for their benefit. And the other thing is a change in the regulations where you say, let's try to make the world one in which even if corporations are as money-minded as they can possibly be, these corporations nevertheless do more good. So in other words, let's hang the sausage that is motivating, the sausage of profit that is motivating companies, let's hang it exactly in the right place so that the corporations go in exactly the right direction. Even though they think only of the sausage, they do the right thing automatically. 
right? And so uh, here the model would be something like uh, UPS, right? UPS is a big company, and the company is doing something that I think is just a miracle, right? And I use them every now and then to get things to the remotest corners of the universe, and how they can do it for the ridiculous price that they're charging me is completely beyond my comprehension, right? So for 15 bucks, I can get a parcel delivered to the hindest corner of Africa. And these guys make it happen, because not because they like me or they want to do me a favor. This is straight out of Adam Smith, but because they want to make money. And so it's wonderful, right? And they want to do it cheaply. They want to undersell uh, the USPS and Federal Express and whoever else is in that business. And they do it tremendously successfully. And they have algorithms about how they can minimize you know, the uh, road traffic and how they can you know, optimize this and that. The other thing, traveling salesman problem uh, and so on. And I don't know how they do it, but they do it. And I, I just admire them for it, even though it is in no way morally motivated. So if we could do that with all industries everywhere, I think uh, we would have a much more reliable uh, way of supporting the poor, right? I don't want the poor ultimately to depend for their survival and their health and so forth on the moral motivations of shareholders and corporate executives, that they are willing to give up that extra buck in order not to do something morally awful. I want them, if possible, to have a more secure protection in the fact that it's just not profitable for companies to act in any other way. So the health impact fund system is a way this idea of rewarding pharmaceutical innovation on the basis of health impact is precisely a system that is trying to hang the sausage in the right place by saying to companies, the one and only way in which you will make money for the nice medicines that you invent is by making sure that there's health impact, that these medicines produce health gains. Selling medicines will no longer make you any money, right? Today, uh, pharmaceutical companies make money by selling medicine. And it doesn't matter whether that medicine gets flushed down the toilet, gets eaten by the dog, gets eaten by the wrong person who cannot benefit, who actually gets a stomach ache from it. All of that doesn't matter. The company makes exactly as much money for each pill that it sells, regardless of what the outcome is. The health impact fund would say, you get money if and insofar as there's health gain. If you go after patients who can really benefit, you'll make money. If you go after patients who cannot benefit, you make no money. If you go after patients who get a stomach ache, you lose money, and so on and so forth. Right? And that would uh, go a long way towards a rational pharmaceutical industry, not just for the benefit of the poor, but for the benefit of the rich as well. Everybody would benefit if pharmaceutical companies profits we're tied to what they're in the business of achieving, namely health impact, health gains. So that's what we should do across the board, right? We should pay for companies that develop new agricultural techniques and seeds. We should pay them on the basis of nutrient yield increase, on the basis of pesticide and fertilizer use avoided, methane gas production reduced, antibiotic use reduced, and so on and so forth. For companies that do green innovations, we should pay them on the basis of actual reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, etc, 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 right? And so this would be a whole new way of funding uh, progress, innovation, and so forth on the basis of the good that it does for humanity, where that good is measured on the basis of individuals actually benefiting. So insofar as we can do that, I think that would be far preferable to creating a culture of uh, moral behavior on the part of corporate executives, even though I'm not at all opposed to such a culture. Right? I'd love to have it, and I'd love to do what I can to make it happen. But we should rely on it still, I think, as little as possible. We should have as much of a backup system of rigorous prudential incentives as we can. Uh, let's thank Thomas Pogge for coming. <laughs>